Hi, I'm Tyler Foles. I'm a nuclear engineer, a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at another one of Kurtz Gazat videos called The Black Hole That Kills Galaxies. So the way I think they're going to go with it is they're either going to talk about gamma ray bursts and it's sterilizing a galaxy, which there's so much empty space, I'm, I don't know if I agree with that, or a even bigger than supermassive black hole. Let's take a look. That sounds fascinating. The universe looks like a vast, empty ocean sprinkled with rare islands of galaxies. But this is an illusion. Just a small fraction of all atoms are found in galaxies, while the rest is thought to be drifting in between in the intergalactic medium. Like the roots of some massive tree, gas spreads out from each galaxy, gravity funneling fresh mass into this dense cosmic forest. Here in the intergalactic medium are the raw materials of creation. Hydrogen and helium, woven into sheets and filaments that flow into galaxies where they eventually create stars. But if we look... Hydrogen and helium um, cause uh, nuclear fusion, which is the main fuel source for stars. Um, once they get bigger, they form even heavier elements because the gravity and the pressure is so, so great. But yes, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the entire universe. There's even trace bits in empty space, as they say. We see who's actually in charge. Quasars, the single most powerful objects in existence. As small as a grain of sand compared to the Amazon River, they reside in the centers of some galaxies, shining with the power of a trillion stars, blasting out huge jets of matter, completely reshaping the cosmos around them. They're so powerful that they can kill a galaxy. What are they, and how... Not sure what he means by kill, but... Let's find out. Quasars are massive black holes. Um, the acronym actually stands for quasi-stellar radio because of the immense signals they emit throughout the universe. It's fascinating. They mold the structure of the universe at their whim. Everywhere you look, weird things in the sky. In the 1950s, astronomers noticed mysterious loud radio waves coming from spots all over the sky. They were named quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasars, because they were dots like stars, but were seen in radio waves rather than visible light. Everything about them was strange. Some flickered, others emitted high-energy x-rays in addition to radio waves, but all seemed to be tiny. They all moved extremely fast, as much as... The main difference between X-rays and radio waves, so this is all light we're talking about. Both are invisible, but radio waves, super low energy, super uh, super long, long wavelengths. And then X-rays are, we're, we're getting into higher energy. Um, most cosmic rays are actually even higher energy than X-rays. But the fact that you have that much variation is interesting and certainly caught their attention. The 30%, the speed of light, the only explanation was that they must have been so distant that their apparent speed was actually the expansion of the universe moving them away from us. But these enormous distances meant that quasars couldn't just be stars, but the active cores of galaxies billions of light years away. And it gets crazier. To appear so bright and loud, given these vast distances, they are thousands of times brighter than the entire Milky Way. Monsters exploding and screaming into the void with a violence not thought possible before. As we mapped the sky, we discovered over a million quasars, and they all seem to be very far away. Looking into space far away means very long ago, because light takes so long to reach us. Quasars were common in the early universe, having peaked in number 10 billion years ago when galaxies and the universe itself were still very young. Let's go back in time to... Younger the... Hence, they're, they're showing the Big Bang. Everything was just so much closer together. Now everything's more spread out. Just think of it like being in the center of a big city with a lot of crazy stuff going on there. And crazy stuff is black holes, quasars, things exploding, high temperatures, things of that nature. 
Earth three billion years after the Big Bang and see what was going on back then. The incredible power of quasars. How could an early baby galaxy be so incredibly so bright and violent? All that light and radiation couldn't be stars, as there weren't nearly enough of them. And since galaxies tend to grow with time by merging, the starlight from small galaxies shouldn't be far brighter than any galaxy today. There's only one way to generate the vast amounts of energy a quasar shines with, feeding supermassive black holes. We still don't know how exactly they formed, but it seems that every galaxy has one in their center. But how can the brightest things in the universe be black holes which trap anything and everything that crosses their event horizon? Well, the light of a quasar is not coming from Bit inside paradox, these huh? black holes. Rather, it comes from the space around them, a massive orbiting disk of gas called an accretion disk. Quasars use the same fuel as stars to shine, matter. It's just that black holes are the most efficient engines for converting matter into energy in the universe. The energy released by... <laughs> that... Okay, that, that picture right there was just awesome. I, I love it so much. <laughs> I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> ...falling into a black hole can be 60 times greater than that released by nuclear fusion in the core of a star. Because the energy released by a black hole... There you go. Black holes are the end-all power source, not nuclear fusion. Um, nuclear fusion is still amazing, but um, when it comes to other natural occurring phenomena right there, it's crazy how we're still trying to catch up with things. ...comes from gravity, not from nuclear reactions. Matter falling into a black hole speeds up to almost the speed of light before it crosses the event horizon, buzzing with an incredible amount of kinetic energy. Of course, once inside the black hole, it takes that energy with it. You only get to witness this energy if you drop your matter in the right way. Fall straight down, and the outside universe gets nothing. But when you have a lot of matter, it spirals in incredibly fast towards the event horizon, forming a disk. Collisions between particles and friction are heated up to hundreds of thousands of degrees. In a space not much bigger than our solar system, the core of a galaxy can release many times more energy than all its stars combined. This is what a quasar is. A, a super hungry black hole that eats that. That's, a, that's actually an, an apt analogy that, yeah, um, all the energy racing around from it would produce um, a lot of heat. Um, the one thing to keep in mind, that, that temperature right there, while it's hotter than the surface of a star, it's actually comparable to that of a corona. So that, um, this, this isn't the only place in the universe where you see a similar phenomena due to high speed as well as the, um, the decay heat of whatever um, particles you have going on or in, in circles around there. It's, uh, it's fascinating to look at stuff like that. Super massive black hole having a feast. And these black holes eat a lot. Typical quasars consume one to a hundred Earth masses of gas per minute. 10 billion years ago, the universe was about a third of its current size, so the intergalactic medium was much less spread out, meaning the filaments of gas. Keep in mind, a third of the size, we're talking volume, it's just about the same mass, hence the first law of thermodynamics saying energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Around quasars could feed them a banquet, making them vomit insane amounts of light and radiation. The brightest quasars power jets, tangling the magnetic field of the matter around them into a narrow cone. Like a particle accelerator, they launch enormous beams of matter out, plowing through the circumgalactic medium, forming plumes of matter that grow to hundreds of thousands of light years in size. It's almost unfathomable in scale. A tiny spot in a galaxy carving out patches of the universe hundreds of thousands of light years long. But quasars can't eat for long maybe a few million years, because their <laughs> feast ultimately kills their galaxy. How quasars kill galaxies? There we go. Okay, maybe killing is a bit of an exaggeration. There you go. <laughs> the galaxy is still there after its quasar turns off, but it will never be the same again. Quasars, being among wow. the hottest and brightest things in the universe, break their galaxies by heating them up too much and stopping star formation. Stars are gas that collapsed in on itself and then got really hot. But in a cloud of gas that's already hot, atoms are moving quickly. When they collide, they hit hard, exerting pressure that resists gravity's squeeze. So hot gas cannot form stars. Instead, 
the best gas for forming stars is already cold and won't put up a fight when it's time to collapse into a star. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So I guess you could say it kills galaxies in the sense that it creates an inhospitable environment for star formation. I never quite looked at it like that. That's an interesting um, way to look at that. And it's, it's fascinating how if it's already hot, you, you're bouncing around so, so much that you don't have enough stay time to get the particles to convalesce into a star and ultimately induce nuclear fusion and keep it keep it burning they're just they're too far away from each other on top of that quasars push gas out of their galaxies not only does this starve the one thing i will add to that is there's um there's a few things you need for fusion the extreme temperatures is, is um is, is is only one thing and by the way a hundred thousand degrees celsius is not an extreme temperature we're talking about the center of a star um the sun is about 15 million celsius and in order to create one on Earth, you need to go a step further and get up on the order of 100 million or 150 million degrees Celsius. There are some experiments that are even in the billions of degrees because not only do you need temperature, you need pressure, immense pressure. Stars get that way using gravity, but on Earth, so we just have to raise the temperature up because we don't have the gravitational force of the sun when we make fusion reactors on Earth. Um, the other thing you need is confinement time. You need to keep it in place. So that hostile environment they were talking about earlier of just high temperature um, gas particles going around without anything to confine them, that's true. There's no way you're going to make a star that way. So, but its galaxy loses the raw materials for new stars. <laughs> as and new materials. As sounds, it might be a good thing for life. The alternative can be far more dangerous. Too many stars. Mm -hmm. New stars forming is usually followed by massive stars exploding in supernovae, so planets would be burned sterile. But of course, it's more complicated. Like the intricacies of our own planet's biosphere, every piece of the galaxy is dependent on and influencing every other part of the galactic environment. While hot things like quasars and supernovae tend to push gas out of the galaxy, shockwaves and quasar jets can also compress gas, making new stars at least for a short time. But in general, we can say that without things becoming a bit more chill, we would not exist today. Which brings us to our final question. Did the Milky Way have a quasar in the past? Hmm. It's unclear if every galaxy went through a quasar phase, but understanding distant quasars may provide clues to the history of the Milky Way. Galaxies don't do a good job of preserving their history. Like sand on a beach, the endless churning mixes away the clues to their past. It's possible the Milky Way was once a quasar, which may have allowed our supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star to have grown to four million times the mass of the Sun. And as dormant as it is now, Sagittarius A star could turn into a quasar in the future. In a few billion years, the Milky Way will merge with Andromeda. Yep. We've seen over a hundred double quasars in galaxies smashing together, where fresh gas is provided for the central Double black holes. quasar, like double but rainbow. But it won't last for long. When galaxies merge, so do their supermassive black holes, sinking into the center of their new galaxy, kicking up dust and stars in every direction. We don't know whether this will happen, but it would truly be an incredible sight. Maybe some beings oh, in the yeah. far future are going Imagine. to witness it and be in awe of what they see. But you don't have to wait that long. There are already plenty of fascinating things to explain. <laughs> and then we get into their advertisement. Wow, that's, of course, beautifully animated as always. Um, I would say maybe they don't, um, the quasars don't kill galaxies. They actually give them their shape. And you could make the argument that they actually give life to galaxies because you might end up with too many stars in a situation that you wouldn't actually be able to support life in a galaxy and where stars are constantly being created and destroyed. Um, supernovas pose a risk to nearby solar systems. Gamma ray bursts can pose a risk to nearby solar systems from black holes sterilizing planets. So it's possible these things could actually be life givers rather than killers. Um, let me know what you think of that down in the comments. Thank you very much for watching, and hey, if you uh, like this video, please join me in my journey to a clean, sustainable nuclear energy fusion, but, or future. <laughs>
Fusion's part of it, by liking and subscribing. I'll see you next time.